thank you very much for being here today, and the floor is all yours. Great, thank you, thank you. Ah, perfect microphone works. Yeah, fantastic to be here. So many uh, people interested in quantum technologies, quantum computing, uh, all the good quantum things. Um, quantum science, I guess, more generally. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, as David was saying, it's, a, it's an interesting crowd. It's a difficult crowd to prepare a talk for, but so we, uh, I guess I learned over the past talks and uh, have been uh, adjusting in real time. Uh, so hopefully this will be enjoyable. So the, the, the goal of my talk is of twofold. I want to tell you a little bit about Tensor Networks. Uh, it's sort of an invitation or celebration of that, that area, which of course uh, there's many experts in, in this audience. Uh, and the other thing is uh, to tell you about uh, a little technical result that we obtained with uh, David Perez Garcia's group uh, and our group um, on, on basically pushing some of the theoretical tools that we understand very well in one dimension to higher dimensions. Um, and uh, sort of the, you know, the hope is, of course, you know, that this is an interesting tool for, for some of you to actually play around with, to also get uh, empirical uh, uh, insight on. Um, but also, I'm, I'm very curious to hear sort of about your thoughts on that, uh, on, on that respect. OK, so that's the plan. Um, so uh, yeah, this is, a, again, it's a difficult talk because, of course, half of you are experts in tensor networks, so bear, bear with me. For the other half, maybe the second bit will be a little bit uh, uh, too technical for your taste or maybe uh, too unmotivated for your taste. In the end, everyone will be equally unhappy, will go to lunch, so it will be fantastic. Okay. So, so the starting point for tensor networks, right, is that many body quantum states, uh, because they're many body, they have an exponentially large description, so even writing them down naively on a classical computer is hard. Um, then we say, okay, but, you know, we don't care about generic states, really, but, say, about, you know, um, ground states, low energy states, other kinds of interesting states from a physics perspective, uh, from a computation perspective, and, and that means that maybe we can hope for more compact descriptions, right? And so the idea is that, uh, you know, if uh, the interactions are local, then, you know, maybe the entanglement is also somewhat local. If the entanglement is uh, somewhat local, maybe you can actually build, find a, a building, uh, uh, you can sort of play Lego with your quantum states. You, you can build your many-body states by sort of local entanglement and gluing it together in a way, okay? And so that's the idea behind tensor networks. So a tensor network is a way of defining many-body quantum states. So there's this one button that shuts, shuts down a computer, right? So I'll try not to press it. Um, it's a way of defining many-body quantum states by contracting uh, a network, a graph, or a web of, of local tensors, OK? And uh, of course, here, there's many uh, such families known. Uh, they were mentioned earlier today as well, some of them. Right? For example, matrix product states um, are, are this idea of th that you basically, uh, it's, so it's an ansatz for uh, let's say states away from a phase transition in one dimension. That's, I guess, where they come from. Uh, and the idea is there's lots of uh, little three tensors, maybe the same one if you describe translation variances, maybe not, um, that, uh, well, you sort of put on a line, right? You contract everything that's uh, connected on both sides, and the remaining thing is a quantum state on that you could think of sitting on one line, okay? Um, so that's matrix product states, that's projected entangled pair states uh, uh, proposed by, by Frank Strat and Ignacio uh, Sirac. Right, that's sort of the two-dimensional analog of, of MPS. And there's many more versions. I think IPEPS was mentioned before. Some of you name, know MERA. MERA is sort of a funny run, right? It's sort of a two-dimensional network describing a one-dimensional state. Um, in the talk this morning, uh, uh, we saw, I guess, how to, uh, it was briefly mentioned how to use a one-dimensional network, MPS, to describe a two-dimensional state, or state of natural in two dimensions. So the message being that the network structure can often be inspired by, the, by a physical lattice, but it need not so, okay? And even sort of say in the context of quantum chemistry, maybe you pick orbitals as sort of uh, corresponding to things, and then some of things that are close by in your network structure are things that are more correlated in your system. So I guess it's sort of a bit of an art uh, in this sense, and uh, depending on the context, to pick the right network structure. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So, so this is, of course, a, a very successful numerical tool uh, currently on, on classical computers, hopefully in the future also on quantum computers, uh, in particular for networks, tensor networks that also have an interpretation as a quantum circuit. Um, so it's carving out these little corners in Hilbert space where you want to be in the right corner. Um, that's, that's, again, um, uh, the art I mentioned before. Um, sort of for me as a theorist, I find it also really exciting this, that Tensor Networks provides sort of an analytical framework, a language uh, concept to study uh, complicated or complex uh, quantum phenomena in some sort of uh, dual way. Okay. Uh, so for example, uh, we'll talk later how, you know, how one can study symmetries uh, in an interesting way. People have used you know, this framework successfully to uh, think about topological phases. Uh, this MERA network that some of you may know is connected to ideas like renormalization, also holography. Um, so, you know, one approach to, to thinking about things like black hole, high energy uh, a theory phenomena, uh, like was mentioned earlier, okay, uh, in the context that was mentioned earlier. Super. 
So um, today we'll deal with very simple tensor networks, but we'll try to ask difficult questions about them. And so the protagonists are, are matrix product states and PEPs, okay? And I'll draw up two-dimensional PEPs pictures, but, but everything uh, I'll talk about you can generalize if you like. So just as a reminder for an, an introduction for those of you who have not seen that yet, so matrix product state, in the simplest case, you pick one tensor and just repeat it many times, okay? So you have a little three tensor. Uh, there's this physical bond dimension D and the, the virtual or the bond dimension capital D that sort of is the horizontal uh, dimensions. And so if one such three tensor or tuple of matrices, right, of capital D by capital D matrices, and what you can now do is you can just put them, you know, many copies next to each other, and then maybe you close it up with periodic boundary conditions, and that's, you know, the simplest kind of a so-called uniform or translation variant matrix product states with periodic boundary conditions, okay. So you pick one tensor, so it's a super compact description, right, like it doesn't even depend on system size uh, naively, okay, unless of course you have to tune the bond dimension. It determines to your quantum state of an arbitrary, uh, of arbitrary uh, system size, okay, and I call this cat mn here. Uh, likewise, okay, we can now do the same thing in one dimension higher. So we have a one sort of seat tensor, so it's a four plus one leg tensor, these like in-plane legs are the ones we contract over, they have a this bond dimension, capital D, and then there's a physical leg that's fixed by the physics of the system you're trying to study, and again, you can glue these things together. You just tile, say, a, a, a square or a rectangle here of size, say, n by m, linear size m, n times linear size m. Again, with periodic boundary conditions, um, you get a quantum state, right, for any choice of, of, of rectangular grid. Okay, super. So, um, these are sort of two geometries, a one-dimensional line, a two-dimensional rectang uh, rectangle, rectangular grid. Um, I sort of alluded to, to other, uh, you know, ways of being there. Also this morning was mentioned, you know, if you, uh, if you, if you, do, if you tile a 2D uh, grid by sort of a snake in a snake-like way by a one-dimensional network, right, you have to worry about entanglement and so on and area loss. So let's talk about this briefly. So what's the significance of picking this picture, this picking this network, this, this graph, okay? So uh, basically what it does, it fixes sort of the you know, the kind of entanglement pattern, or maybe more precisely, the entropy um, or the ranks of the quantum states, uh, you, you can, in principle, hope to characterize in such a way. Okay. So, for example, um, so just to make this precise, um, uh, uh, so here what I'm, I'm looking at is, is a subsystem, say a geometric subsystem of my one dimensional chain, of my two dimensional chain, so these one, two, three, four, five, six spins, okay? And I'm asking how large can the entropy be of any quantum state that is being described by such a tensor network, okay? Of this form. So you don't, I, so I, so I don't tell you what's in the tensors. I only tell you the um, sort of uh, uh, the dimensions, right? So the, um, uh, so the minimal possible thing maybe I have to tell you. And then it turns out that the entropy, and actually even the log rank, if you like, so any Renyi entropy, uh, is upper bounded by essentially the size of the boundary of this region. Okay, so here the boundary consists of one plus two sides. Uh, here it consists of set of the number of bonds you have to cut on the outside here um, to separate the green legs from the other dangling legs. Uh, times uh, the logarithm of the bond dimension, right, because you have the logarithm of the bond dimension, many entangled pairs on each bond, right, because we, you're counting, we're counting qubit pairs and entropy is counted in, in qubits. Okay. So, uh, and I mean, that's a gen a true in general, a very simple argument, and, and whatever picture you draw, so you, you pick your favorite uh, network, okay, so you, now you ask how large can the entropy be, and then you just have to cut through the bonds to separate the subsystem you care about from all the, from the remain, from the complement, and there's many ways of, cu of cutting, of course, in principle, like here I could have also have cut like so, you pick, you cut in the minimal way, and that gives you an upper bound, okay. And then, I mean, one can show that it's saturated generically, but that's not, not so important for today. So um, uh, I, I guess one motivation that is always mentioned then for, for why, why one should worry about tensor networks or, or like them is that actually in 1D it's uh, rigorously established that low energy states of local, the geometric uh, local uh, gapped uh, lattice systems also satisfy an area law. Okay? And so sort of by analogy one could at least, you know, uh, reasonably hope, or not by analogy, one could therefore at least hope that uh, such low energy states are well described can be well approximated by matrix product states. So the one dimensional version of this idea, okay. And that's indeed true. So it is true that um, uh, these kind of states, they have uh, compact descriptions uh, in, for, um, uh, as matrix product states, where compact means the bond dimension doesn't have to be uh, large enough. Uh, that could be great, right? You would still not know how to find them. Well. We know how to find them, we use DMRG, or you use DMRG. Um, uh, sort of as a theorist, maybe we're still slightly unhappy, right? You want rigorous algorithms that really provably find these states, and even if they're actually a bit slow and we can't maybe use them in practice. So that's also actually true. So they can even be found efficiently in polynomial time. 
And then it's also the case that in one dimension, basically everything is easy to compute with because you know you can do your contractions, your sideways instead of top to bottom. But but I think for those of you who like to compute tensor networks, that's something you've seen, of course, many times. So everything's perfect in one dimension, and then everything's terrible in higher dimension. Okay, in theory. Okay. So um, everything is sort of hard, right? We, we, we don't know that such compact descriptions exist. Um, uh, so pr particularly, we're not sure how to find them rigorously, OK? Um, even if we found them, we wouldn't know how to compute efficiently with them, because contracting two-dimensional tensor networks is hard, right? And so lots of smart ideas have been come up to not worry about the sort of the theories being you know, negative, as, as they sometimes are, and still do it, right? So uh, as was discussed this morning, or you know, IPEPs, I guess, was also mentioned, right? It's this two-dimensional idea of some effective environment. You still, I mean, you get am amazing results, OK? So that's, uh, that's maybe uh, an interesting uh, tension and it, I guess it's also a call for theorists to, to try to do better, okay, and, and sort of um, uh, maybe look at things in a different way, okay. And I want to give you sort of in, in a sort of a slightly different context one way what it, you know, could, uh, uh, sort of in a, in a concrete setting, something called fundamental theorems, which we'll talk about in a moment, how sort of a change of perspective can, can it turn such a no-go result or in this case even an undecidability result into something that, that can actually be done, okay. And so maybe that gives us hope to solve uh, more difficult, uh, to also give new insights into more difficult problems. Okay, so that was sort of my uh, tensor network uh, prelude. Um, uh, sort of, I mean, of course, in, in the interest of, uh, I, mean, I guess these were four slides, so I, I didn't do many people justice. Uh, uh, possibly also in the audience, I apologize for that. Um, so I want to talk now about uh, the second uh, point in my, in, my, in my title, which is the, the, the term fundamental theorem. Okay. So fundamental theorem is, uh, well, it's something that answers a fundamental question. So what is the fundamental question? Fundamental question is the following. Suppose uh, you have two MPS tensors or PEPS tensors. I guess here I'm drawing MPS tensors. When do they generate the same quantum state for arbitrary system size? Right? That's sort of a, a question you could ask. Right? What is sort of the redundancy, the ambiguity in the description? Maybe you can cut it down even more. Okay. And uh, it's easy to see that such a redundancy exists sort of by, by design of the ansatz. Okay. So if you have two MPS tensors, for example, the red one and the blue one, and this red one, uh, you left multiply one virtual bond by, by some matrix G and on the other side with its inverse. So then, of course, if you compute this uh, corresponding many-body quantum state, all the G, G inverses cancel, right? There's a G inverse here, a G here, G inverse here, G and so on. Everything cancels. So clearly, this defines the same quantum state for any system size, okay? So that kind of we have to deal with, right? I mean, there's no way around. It's just that because we like this ansatz, okay? Um, Similarly, okay, for PEPs, uh, now you have even more freedom, right? Because you sort of treat the horizontal and the vertical direction differently. You can insert GG inverses on the horizontal in plane legs and HH inverse some other matrix uh, on the, on the uh, vertical in plane legs, okay? And again, these give you the same many-body quantum states on arbitrary uh, systems for arbitrary system size, okay? And so often this is called the gauge symmetry um, of, of uh, tensor, the tensor network formalism of this class of tensor networks, uniform uh, PEPs. Um, and uh, as we said, okay, uh, it preserves the quantum state for any system size, okay. And something that seems maybe a little technical is you can actually also take limits of such symmetries, okay. And that sounds like, okay, like mathematician speaking, but it actually means that you can sort of simplify uh, your things. You can throw away sort of off diagonal elements that you never see on the state, and I, I think maybe the, the MPS and, and perhaps people among you, you know what I mean. So, uh, so that, that's sort of, you know, something that's fundamentally there, and you sort of can't help, okay. Um, but amazingly, okay, so uh, that's the only thing, basically. That's basically the only ambiguity, the only redundancy in the, in the approach, okay? So in one dimension, it's known that this gauge symmetry and taking limits is the only redundancy. Um, and one can actually try to pick a canonical form, like a sort of a normal form, um, uh, that sort of uh, tries to get rid, get rid of, you know, uh, some of this redundancy without making too many choices, okay? And, and sort of, um, so that's known as the fundamental theorem of matrix product states uh, due to yeah, Ignacio, uh, David, and Norbert, and then with Gemma, I think there, there's more refined, more generalized versions. Um, and so basically what it says is that two tensors, right, they give rise to the same many-body quantum states for all system size, if and only have, they have the same canonical forms, okay. Um, and they have the same canonical forms if and only if they're related by the gauge symmetry and taking limits, okay. And that seems like, okay, that's like mass fact, great, fantastic. Uh, but it actually has lots of applications. So in the classification symmetries, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, uh, other applications, it also appears to be practically useful, right? It's sort of um, going to the canonical form is a bit like picking a well-conditioned representation of your, of your tensor, okay? So it maybe tells you how to truncate, and I hope to comment on this a little bit uh, later. But sort of, um, in some sense, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful story in 
1D, but sort of when one goes to higher dimensions, there's many problems. I'll talk about some of them before. So somehow there's uh, uh, maybe not a satisfactory answer. Maybe there will never exist one. Um, but I'll tell you a, 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 an answer, OK, that, that is new uh, in a moment. Before that, though, I want to briefly um, indicate why this is an interesting result, even if you didn't care, uh, um, let's say, uh, about the, the subtleties of, of redundancies and descriptions beforehand. Okay. Suppose you have an, a matrix product state um, uh, that uh, has a global symmetry for any system size. Okay? So, so in other words, there exists some little unitary u that is such that u to the tensor n, it fixes your state. Okay? Or in pictures, this is your MPS, you apply this unitary u. Whoa, whoa, whoa. OK, the magic button I've hit. <laughs> Uh, super, uh, such that uh, you get the same state back, okay. So now, of course, you can regroup this tensor, right, this red tensor together with u as just another tensor. So now you have two MPS descriptions, two distinct MPS descriptions of the same quantum state, okay. Suppose that's true for any system size, then the fundamental theorem tells you, well, actually, uh, this di distinct tensor, this new tensor that describes the same family of quantum states actually is just related by a gauge symmetry up to taking limits, which I'm ignoring, to the original tensor, okay? So in other words, you can lift this sort of physical on-site symmetry to a virtual symmetry, u, u dagger, which is a different unitary, right? Maybe a gigantic, a big unitary if the bond dimension is large, on this virtual level, okay? And so in the end, now, we are basically led to studying, you know, such, uh, such intertwining relations, okay? Um, and, and, you know, what are those kind of... Uh, so, so, it's, so in the end, you turn down an infinite problem, in a way, onto a problem of linear algebra, of group theory, right? Basically, what are the possible intertwiners you can find here? And, uh, you know, if, maybe in physics terms, it, it, it relates the classification of SPTP phases to the classification of projective representations, okay, of, of your symmetry group. And so that has been done, you know, very successfully by, 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 by people, maybe even partly in the room. Okay, super. So that's, that's maybe a nice motivation, right? Like maybe even you didn't care before, you make this one structural assumption, which is of course strong, maybe, right? That your one-dimensional state is well approximated by an MPS and then this comes out of the machinery. Okay, and that's a cool, a, a cool, a cool classification result in the end. Okay, so let's talk a bit about computation complexity. So one question that maybe uh, you didn't uh, uh, worry about asking, but, but now we ask, uh, and which has a positive answer thanks to this fundamental theorem is that in particular we can decide, given two tensors, M and M prime, uh, do they generate the same quantum states for all system sizes, okay? And it's, it's a bit of a tricky question, right? Because it's a, for all system sizes, it's like an unbounded problem, but it reduces basically to checking if the canonical forms can be related, okay? And so that can be done efficiently. Uh, and now comes the bad news, and, and that's sort of what I mentioned uh, sort of briefly before, which is that actually for PEPs and higher dimensions, this is an undecidable problem, okay? So, one, so there's no algorithm that takes as input two PEPs tensors and that tells you, yes, it's gonna generate the same antibody state for all system sizes, or no, there's gonna be some system size where you see difference. And that basically suggested, I mean, that there should be no useful fundamental theorem, right? Because, because if there was one, it was somewhat effective, right? It would maybe give you maybe a, an, an inefficient, but at least some algorithm to tackle this problem, right? Because this fundamental theorem basically reduces an unbounded problem into a finite problem, okay? And um, so what I want to convince you basically in the remainder of the talk is that um, uh, one can sort of you know, turn one heads around and look at the problem a bit differently and arrive at actually something positive, which is maybe, uh, you know, of, of interest. Okay. So I want to change the perspective a little bit. And the idea of, for changing this perspective is extremely simple. Okay. And it goes as follows. So when two, two PEPs tensors, like uh, uh, the blue and the red one here, are related by gauge symmetry, then as we discussed, they determine the same antibody state or any uh, grid. Okay. Any grid with periodic boundary conditions. But of course, actually, there's nothing special about grids. You could just as well take your favorite way of gluing together PEPs tensors, you know, and such that horizontal goes to horizontal, vertical goes to vertical. Um, for example, in this like crazy way, okay. Or maybe more uh, conceptually, instead of just putting your many body quantum state onto a torus, you could put it onto a, a surface of higher genus, okay. So you should think of this as sort of a, you know, a, sort of a microscopic version of just like somewhat regularly putting your many body state on, on, on say, some higher water surface, but some more holes than uh, uh, just a donut. Okay. And basically the punchline is that if you do that, uh, things become nice. Okay. So if you allow yourself, if you say, okay, I don't only care about equivalence on a, on a torus, on a, on a periodic boundary conditions, but rather I'm happy with arbitrary surfaces or topologies or graphs, then again the gauge symmetry and taking limits is the only redundancy. We can again find a canonical form that's just as happy as the one before. Um, and, and maybe that's you know, a new tool in the tensor network toolbox in higher dimensions. Okay. Um, cool, so, uh, so that's maybe the key message and the, everything else will be a bit of a bonus. Um, 
So I want to talk a little bit more about what this works, and what I want to tell you about is, well, I want to make the sentence precise and also tell you what this canonical form looks like, okay? And it's a funny one because it's even a bit different than in one dimension to the standard ones, okay? So let's see how this works. So basically, what we do is the following, and maybe first look at the picture. So suppose you have some tensor, uh, this red tensor. Now, we get this whole family of gauge equivalent tensors, right, by buying GG inverse, HH inverse. And somehow we have to, we, I want to single out something that's somewhat uh, canonical, okay, somewhat unique, uh, maybe not up to unitaries, but uh, uh, maybe at most uh, unique up to, un uh, maybe unique up to unitaries, okay, because unitaries are kind of, I don't want to pick a basis. So one thing I can do, and maybe the only thing that I can do that, that comes to mind is I could just say, okay, what's the, what's the object with the smallest norm that is gauge symmetric to my original tensor, okay? So um, I'm looking at all the tensors that I get by applying the gauge symmetry, and I just minimize the norm. Okay, so very innocent, very general prescription. In other words, uh, we define the minimal canonical form of a PEPS tensor in any dimension by minimizing the L2 norm of any tensor I can get by applying this gauge group, and then, okay, I also have to allow limits. Okay. And uh, it's not clear that it is, but it is unique up to unitary, so these minimal norm uh, objects are, are essentially unique, okay, as unique as they can be if you minimize a norm that's, you know, invariant under unitaries. Um, you need the limit in general for this, for this canonical form to exist, but actually we also need that for MPS, so that's not really a big deal. We just never say the word limit, we usually phrase it in a different way. We, um, okay. Um, uh, it's pretty natural, I guess, right? Like, I mean, we didn't really pick anything, it just, I mean, we sort of used sort of the only thing maybe we had available. Um, and uh, it's clearly it's pretty general, right? You could try this in any, I mean, for many different tensor network formats and questions, do you get something interesting, okay? But at least it's picking out something, okay? So what does it pick out? So that's uh, the statement of our fundamental theorem then. So our fundamental theorem says that two PEPS tensors, they have the same minimal canonical form if and only if they give rise to the same tensor network states on any graph, topology, surface, as you want to call it in the way I mentioned before. So you, you take many copies of your tensor, so it's a uniform PEPS, okay, so you take the same copies, you connect to left to right, up to bottom, in any way you like, okay, and you get the same anybody state, if and only if actually they have the same, what we call minimal canonical form, okay. And actually, the, having the same minimal canonical form is also exactly the same as saying you can go, uh, T and T prime are related by gauge symmetries and, again, taking limits, okay. So that's kind of the, the twist, okay? So we changed the problem. I mean, of course, we had to change the problem. It was undecidable before. Okay, so we changed the problem uh, a little bit and, and maybe in an interesting way, uh, and suddenly things become nicer, okay? And um, I see the clock is moving towards me and being pointed at me, and it says five minutes. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, so, so that's, that's sort of the punchline a bit more precisely. Uh, as sort of a side effect, we, we get an interesting uh, observation, namely um, for matrix products, uh, you could ask, you know, if you have two inequivalent MPS tensors, how large of a system do you have to look at to actually see a different quantum state, okay? Um, we can sort of, uh, I, I don't think it had been observed before in the general setting, so we can sort of use the technologies that go under this, uh, behind this theorem to show that basic linear is enough for, you know, D log D system size is enough. In contrast, we find that for PEPs to tell, to tell two PEPs apart, in general, you have to go to an exponential system size, okay? So that's, I mean, we can't even contract that if the system size were not exponential, but, but here it's even exponential, okay? So that's pretty interesting, um, and it's also enough, okay, basically. So, um, Nevertheless, okay, uh, there are some finite system size on which uh, it's enough to check whether your PEPs is the same, okay? So I'm, in some sense, I'm saying here, uh, you know, two PEPs are equivalent on any system size, if and only if they're enough for, say, you know, networks, graphs of, uh, you know, exponential in the bond dimension system size. So that's a finite thing you could just check. You just write down all the PEPs with at most e to the d or e to the d squared many nodes, right? Uh, so suddenly this problem became decidable in a horribly inefficient way. And maybe it's interesting to meditate sort of, you know, why should this now be okay? Like what, what, what gave, what gave uh, you know, what changed, okay? And uh, maybe I just want to be super high level. So the idea is basically this undecidability for these rectangular grids. It's related to a problem of, I mean, the way people think about it. It's a problem of uh, tiling uh, a torus with, with uh, so periodically tiling a plane with, with tiles, okay? One can easily convert such a tile set into a, a PEPS tensor. And that's undecidable, okay, and it's, I guess maybe an intuition is that you're kind of, in, because you have these like two directions, you can sort of encode computation in one direction and then maybe some computation looping. That's maybe a one cartoon one can have in mind. But now, of course, we, if you allow ourselves to connect in an arbitrary, uh, in an arbitrary way, right? I mean, there's no time, there's no you know, direction of computation, it's just like you have much more freedom, okay? So for example, this is actually a tile set 
for which it is known that you cannot periodically tile a plane. Okay. But here I'm just tiling it in a, in a funny way, with funny boundary conditions. And you note that I'm only connecting top and bottom and left and right. Okay. So you could think of this as a funny higher order genus surface, right? If you glue it, actually, if you fold, do it in paper and you glue it together. Super. So um, maybe last question is, can we actually find these canonical forms? Uh, yes, we can. And it's sort of an interesting comment because actually even in one dimension, if you try to do this, it would not be so obvious. I mean, so you don't get you know, the left or the right or the Vidal or whoever's canonical form, but you get a slightly different beast. Uh, you get a beast for which it's very easy to prove a fundamental theorem once you have established it, but, but maybe not so clear how to compute it. Okay. And what we find is that at least uh, for fixed one dimension, we can approximate uh, approximately find this canonical form. Uh, in polynomial time, and it's, I just want to say it's maybe, maybe more for interest for, for either if you want to actually implement things um, or, or if you care sort of about the complexity of, uh, you know, of methods in the universe. It's sort of combining some recent ideas from the computer science, uh, something called Paulson's problem, uh, Vern Paulson, who has also you know, been working on operator algebras, which I guess featured in the previous talk, uh, with some new ideas from, from the era of convex optimization that we have been working on. Uh, with, uh, with several colleagues, uh, Peter Burgess, uh, Abi Wittges, and uh, lots of uh, our students and postdocs. Um, and basically, the idea is that there's some hidden convexity in all of this. Like the, so the gauge group is a non-commutative group. Non-commutative groups also always give hard to difficult problem, uh, rise to difficult problems, curved spaces in this case, but in a certain way, thing, a way still things are convex. And whenever things are convex, then you have confidence that a simple greedy algorithm, let's say gradient descent or a Newton method, will actually probably work. Okay. Cool. Ah, maybe uh, the, in the last minute. Uh, so is it actually useful? Should someone care? Um, uh, I guess I mentioned before, canonical forms are used, right? And, and they give rise to right, like, like sort of the truncation schemes, right? Like if you go to a canonical form and then you throw away, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, small singular values, maybe that's, uh, that's something we often do. Uh, uh, people tell me it's also useful in improving numerical stability, okay? And one could ask, how about this funny new canonical form? Okay, is it useful? Um, and it's, I mean, it's a problem we are looking at, actually, with a group of uh, Marika and Banyuls, but, but very excitedly, and, okay, something happened here, um, very excitedly, um, uh, there was a, actually a preprint where other people sort of uh, jumped on, you know, uh, they, they saw, I guess, a uh, such proposal, and they actually used it in, in, a, in an interesting context, okay, extracting CFD data from fixed-point tensors, and they, okay, they, they claim, okay, that, that, that actually stability is being improved in this particular application. So I think it's maybe worth looking into a bit, maybe it gives us a new toolbox, Maybe also in settings where we maybe don't care about rigorous results, right? But we just want to kind of do the best numerics we can do for, for a certain cost, okay? And yeah, with this, maybe I want to close. So um, gave a little intro to, to tensor networks, um, what they're good for. I mean, they're focusing on quantum physics today, but there's also other motivations where we could have talked about. Um, some of us know, others maybe know now, these, these tools, fundamental theorems, canonical forms. And we give a sort of maybe a, 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 you know, a general generalization, I guess, in the sense of you know, not, not using any, any detailed uh, assumptions um, beyond 1D, uh, connecting uh, you know, sort of tensor network uh, theory, uh, physics, formalism to, to some new tools from computer science. Okay. And there's many, I mean, uh, to me at least, exciting open questions, right? Can we go faster? Right now the bond dimension has to be fixed, and actually things are tricky in the bond dimension, more tricky than in 1D. Uh, that's sort of a question that actually has implications even on the theory of computing, so that's very exciting to me. Um, how about other kinds of tensor networks? Here we did uniform MPS and PEPs. Okay, how about others? Uh, I mean, I, I told you how you know, it's so important to go to higher genus surfaces, so topology matters. Is there actually a connection to topological order here? Something interesting, you know, like can be like some exotic phase that we can only tell apart on higher genus surfaces? Does that relate, okay, to, to the story? Um, and then, of course, maybe a, a really important one uh, over here that I mentioned before. Yeah, so thanks a lot for it attention. Thank you very see much. A, see a question uh, in the audience. Michael, uh, let's right away start with questions. Oh. Uh, thanks, Michael, for this very nice talk. So I, I just have two uh, small questions. So one is that, uh, as far as I know, um, um, for example, two-dimensional paths, uh, if, if you focus on uniform paths, which are injective, um, then you sort of, I thought you had this sort of like a similar theorem, right? Basically, you can have, uh, you, you can basically say that yeah, they're yeah, they yeah, even right, only right, right, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah, I should have, I should have said this uh, with a more, with a bit more uh, uh, care or, or time. So, so, so I guess when I was talking about general results and so on, it was exactly not assuming, say, normality or injectivity. That's right. Yeah. Ah, awesome. So yeah, you're yeah. results saying that any. That's any right. Path. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh, that's cool. So it's okay. kind of, uh, it's yeah, it's kind of interesting also because. Uh, 
maybe even the, the looking at the MPS case is a sort of bit of interesting because we sort of don't put it in, uh, but sort of, uh, but the significance of the interactivity comes out in an interesting way, actually. For, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and, and the second question is exactly related to the, uh, so, so how does this, um, so for example, we know this, uh, uh, we can classify these phases of matter using these uh, 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 virtual symmetries, yeah. and uh, especially for um, for PEPs, I mean, these virtual symmetry can come in different form, right? It doesn't have to be this these single site. Uh, exactly. These exactly. Like, like form. for top of order, I guess people use these like like you know, sort of inserting basic strings, right? Trying exactly. to find you string can have operators. MPO symmetry. To to correct, correct, and, yeah, yeah. and the physical symmetry can actually translate to these MPO symmetry, which are strings of yep. you know yep, operators yep, yep, acting yep, yep, on yep. tensors instead of like tensor product of yes. you know individual. Yes. So these are not included in your fundamental theorem, right? So at least in this form. Um, that, that's right. That's that's correct. Yeah. So that's that's actually also that's like what that. Uh, Let's say that that's one extremely interesting direction, even just to recover maybe known results mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in 2D, say, tensor network theory. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's certainly one interesting direction. I mean, so here I only focused on uniform uh, PEPs, right? So I guess if you inserted the string operator, something would become non-uniform in a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, you could also say, okay, even if I have a non-uniform PEPs, sort of maybe I actually, well, maybe I don't want to care about non-uniform PEP, but inserting a string operator gives me something non-uniform, mm -hmm. right? Like a loop or something. Yeah. Um, does this thing generalize? For example, you know, why don't we just minimize the sum of the norms for squares of all the individual PEPS tensors? Okay. Mm -hmm. And actually one can go this way. And, and I feel like maybe that's useful. I mean, sort of many of the things, you know, just work the same way, but sort of your notion of what does it mean to put things at different surfaces becomes a bit richer, a bit more interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can talk about, I mean, it's a bit maybe uh, too technical uh, to give like a, a great answer now. But um, uh, that would be for me a good starting point actually to look at this question. Yeah, so I think, I think there's a, maybe a starting point, but not, uh, not an end point. So we, have, we, we don't have, let's say, a simplified argument or something you know, of, of the work mm -hmm. that you mentioned uh, relating MPO symmetries and, mm -hmm. um, and, and topological order. And I guess also, I mean, Sort of here, I, I guess usually, right, we, I mean, the, the work also you mentioned, I mean, it's, it's kind of all about the torus, right? I mean, you have a torus, you insert uh, loops and so on, and you try to find this, uh, like a basis of this intertwinedness to reconstruct your modular tensor category. Mm -hmm. um, so somehow, uh, I feel like f to see the relevance of this higher uh, genus surfaces, maybe you have to look at maybe something more exotic, right? So mm -hmm. maybe uh, it's not no, even clear that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. but then you have simple ones, right? So for example, for symmetry protected topological phases, you yep. can really extract these cohomology right, yep, groups yep. directly from these local yep. uh, virtual yep, yep, symmetries, yep, 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 right? Yep, yep. But they also look like strings. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So that's you right. don't have yeah. to uh, yeah. uh, uh, sit on topologically non-trivial services to do yes. this, I think. That, that's, that's correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, thanks. That, that's really cool. Yeah. Cool, thanks. I think there's another question there. <laughs> yeah, I have a very simple question. To, so does the minimum canonical form reveal the Schmidt values? Um, ah. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. like how is that your truncation based on? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, so, so it's uh, um, even in one D, it's not the same. It's not. It's not directly related to the Schmidt values. So it's a bit different. So actually, maybe I'll, I'll uh, let me see. I may have a. Uh, uh huh. Maybe that's an interesting one. Okay. So basically, you could ask like, is, uh, yeah. So for, for say for left canonical form, right? We know what it means. It means like if you think of your three tens as a quantum state, you trace over two legs, you get the identity, right? And similarly, so you could ask what is sort of the condition that characterizes uh, being in mi for a tensor to be already in minimal canonical form. And it basically means that, um, uh, uh, so if this is, uh, maybe I should have done it for PEPs, uh, for MPS here. So for MPS, it would mean that um, uh, the left marginal, the left bond marginal is equal to the right bond marginal, maybe up to conjugation. So it's not saying one, it's an isometry from one to the other side or vice versa, but it's sort of, the, it's the same marginal, but this margin is not necessarily, I think, the square root of the singular values or something, or the, the singular values, let's say. And in, in high dimensions, there's a similarly very clean uh, characterization in terms of just equations. So it's basically saying a PEPS tensor, say a four plus one tensor, is in minimum canonical form if and only if, if you contract, say, all the legs except for the right horizontal one, you get the same matrix as the other way around. Up to, I, I suppressed a conjugation here, but uh, a complex uh, conjugation here. So it's more like left equals right marginal and front equals back marginal, I guess. Uh, and not uh, saying it's isometric, say, in any like, diagonal direction or something like this. Yeah. So different, say, from is isometric. Uh, oops, yeah. So yeah, so I say so that's for me actually one of the maybe more more serious questions. Yeah, what's the interpretation of this? Like, what is the meaning, for example, of the reduced density matrices? I mean, you could just go with them, right? And you can use them to truncate. Like, you just look at say you, know, so you try to throw away the smallest eigenvalues of, of these you know left and right marginals. But then, what does it mean? I mean, is it just a similar heuristic than other heuristics we do that is not maybe particularly 
you know, well grounded that it tells us some optimality, but or, or is there something more to it? Yeah. Thanks. Time for a last question. Yeah. I think it was in that area. So yeah, I, I got the microphone. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for a very very nice talk, uh, Michael. Beautiful results. Um, very interesting. Um, I was triggered a bit by uh, your uh, computing the canonical form, which you said can be done in polynomial time if the bond dimension is constant. So I assume that your uh, algorithm some somehow runs in time n to the d, where d is the bond dimension. Um, so w what happens if you let d go to, to, to larger values? Is it a problem at least in NP or in P space? Um, so definitely in P space, I think. Um, in NP, actually, it's not clear. Yeah, but, but more, like, more like for annoying reasons, not maybe. So it's a bit more like a rounding, rounding thing. Un understood, but, but, but yeah, it yeah, could yeah, be yeah. like yeah. NP hard. Uh, uh, it could be, and in some sense, it would have actually impact on, on questions that are not uh, obviously related to tensor networks. Yeah. So I think many computer scientists will be very excited uh, either way. Okay. It's, uh, it's closely related to yeah, these operator tensor scaling things that, you know, with uh, also these, this, these, this gang we have been looking at. Um, so it's, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, for us it was kind of a cool new, or for some of us it was a cool uh, new application basically of this, of this sort of paradigm, of this framework. Uh, but also, it, it actually, if one could prove comp hardness of, of, say, a physics problem here, it would actually have interesting applications to computer science. Yeah. Okay, so thanks. Enough. Thanks. So, uh, lunch time is approaching. If there are no more announcements for uh, the organizing committee, I think uh, we can uh, thanks again very much, uh, Michael, for his very interesting talk. Thank you.